Hi everyone, it's me, Diana, the Doll Fairy. Oops, I mean, <clears throat> welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Opera Populaire. We are so glad you've decided to spend Halloween night with us here at our illustrious theater. This evening's show will feature a collaboration between talented artists, including Anastasia Custom, Dollightful, The Dolly Geek, Enchanterium, Etalon, Holly Crafts, Hextian, Jackie O, Cairo's Workshop, Moonlight Jewel, Mr. Super Customs, Val Kitty's World, and myself. Come together to bring you a dazzling group of dolls, guaranteed to inspire the spooky Halloween spirit in your hearts and bring chills to your spine. Thank you to all of these amazing artists for collaborating on this year's Halloween special. After the performance tonight, don't forget to check out all of their dolls by going to the channel links in the description below. And now for the main event. Tonight, we will be creating a doll inspired by the mysterious and alluring Phantom of the Opera. Did I not instruct that box five was to be kept empty? Um, I'm sorry, box five? Should these demands be ignored, a disaster beyond your imagination will occur. Oh dear, it seems we've upset the opera ghost. Because all these other ghosts are here. <laughs> oh well, the show must go on. Thank you, thank you. The Phantom of the Opera originated as a French novel written by Gaston Leroux in the early 1900s, and since then the story has been retold many times in various adaptations. The most notable of these is undoubtedly the stage musical written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, which debuted in London's West End in 1986 and Broadway in 1988, and has subsequently become the longest-running show in Broadway history. As a young teenager, I first watched the 2004 film based on the play with my cousins, and I was enthralled by the costumes, the characters, and of course, the music. The character of the Phantom is a tortured soul, who was cast away by society because of his face. He lurks beneath the opera house composing music and watching Christine Daae, a young ballerina and soprano singer who believes that the voice which has been teaching her to sing is an angel of music sent to her by her deceased father. The Phantom causes havoc and even commits murder in his pursuit of Christine, but despite her fear of him, Christine's selfless compassion shows him that there is still good in the world. The sumptuous costumes and drama in both the play and the film have always inspired me, so for this Halloween, I've decided to create a doll based on the Phantom of the Opera. I'll be making a female gender-bent version of the Phantom, and I'll base the doll's look on this amazing costume worn by the Phantom when he crashes the Masquerade Gala. The outfit is referred to as the Mask of the Red Death costume, and in the play it features this terrifying skull mask that adds to the Phantom's arresting and intimidating appearance. I'm going to use this Lizzie Hartz doll as a base because she already has long black hair with a streak of red, which I think will be perfect for this doll. She's on the shorter Ever After High body, so I intended to swap her onto this standard body, but by the time I later remembered I wanted to do that, I had already done the face up and didn't want to ruin it by head swapping, so we will just have a petite phantom. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, the phantom wears a mask originally because his face is scarred or disfigured, but of course, if you're familiar with my style, you know that I like to make things pretty and I'm not really into horror art, so let's take a cue from the operetta Monster High doll, who has musical designs molded into her face. I don't otherwise love her purple skin tone, so I opted not to use that doll as a base, but I do really like the concept. So I am planning to give my doll a similar musical pattern on a large portion of her face, along with red roses and some other elegant motifs. After masking off her hair and body, removing her face paint with acetone, and spraying the doll's face with three separate layers of Mr. Super Clear sealant, I'm ready to start on her face up using my Prismacolor watercolor pencils. Although the skull mask she will wear is going to look intimidating, her face underneath doesn't need to look particularly menacing. 
I wasn't sure at first what kind of facial expression to give her, and you'll see me redoing the eyebrows a few separate times, trying to find her identity. Ultimately, I decided that she should look rather cool and indifferent, very elegant and composed, with just a hint of her underlying emotional turmoil and pain. I'm sketching out the main features first before I start on all of the surrounding designs. Since the color scheme for this doll will be deep reds, golds, and black, I'll be giving her some piercing red eyes that will show from underneath her mask later on. Then I start sketching the roses and the musical motif with my light brown pencil. You'll also notice some tear shapes at the outer corner of her right eye, which is the hint of that inner pain deep down that the phantom carries. Around the main decorations, I decided to create a network of lines that imply cracked porcelain, like a broken and neglected vintage porcelain doll. I'm using soft pastels ground into a fine powder and gray, black, and crimson for her eye makeup. Around her eyes needs to be very dark so that when she wears her skull mask, you will only be able to see mostly black around the eyes, which will look creepy and menacing. Her lips will also be a deep dramatic red. Still on the first layer of the face up, I'm adding some initial colors to the decorations on her face. I tried to use pastels to whiten that half of the face to enhance the cracked porcelain look, but the pastels really didn't do much. Instead, I will go back later with a white pencil to fill in all of the shapes inside the crack lines. Now I spray her again to seal what we have so far and to move on to the next layer. I deepen all of the initial colors I laid down in the first layer and darken the outlines of all of the designs with black pencil.
I also make the eye makeup darker and more vibrant with each subsequent layer. You might notice that a few shapes within the network of cracks were filled in with a golden yellow color instead of white. When we are satisfied with the face up and have sealed the final layer, we are going to take some metallic gold paint and fill in those spaces as well as the tear shapes. I really like the effect that this gives the face, as if her face were painted white and bits of it flaked off to reveal gold underneath. It adds to this feeling of the character having all of these mysterious layers and never revealing her true self to the world. I was very afraid to do this, but I decided to add gold to her eyelashes as well. First, I sketched the lash highlights with white pencil and then carefully went over the delicate wispy lines with the gold paint. I add an eye shine with white acrylic paint and also brighten the whites of the eyes. I also glossed her lips, but I forgot to film that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> now let's make her mask. I'm covering her face with plastic wrap to protect it, but I do need to sculpt the mask onto her finished face so that I will know that it covers the right amount of her face and it's placed correctly for her eyes to show beneath the mask's eye holes. I'm using two-part epoxy sculpt, which is very popular among doll customizers. And once it's mixed, I have around an hour or so to sculpt it before it starts to harden and get difficult to work with. I really wasn't sure how this was going to turn out and I was afraid to try, but I decided to just dive in and I gave it a shot. I don't have any fancy sculpting tools because I'm too cheap to buy them. So I used toothpicks, sewing pins, and paintbrush handles to help me out. So for the design of the mask, I decided I wanted to combine the dramatic skull mask, which actually covers the phantom's entire face, with the classic phantom mask that everyone pictures when they think of the phantom of the opera, which only covers some of the face. This mask will cover most of the face, but will still be asymmetrical to cover most of the designs on the doll's face. It starts out looking a lot like a ninja turtle. <laughs> and later the lizard from Spider-Man, but eventually it starts to look like a creative interpretation of a human skull. When I created the angles and ridges in the different areas of the face by pinching the clay and emphasized the angles of the brow to give the skull an angry, vengeful look, I finally felt like it was coming together. I also added some teeth, which looked really cool as well. By now you can actually kind of see how the clay is beginning to look a little different because it's beginning to harden and it's now a lot less flexible. I was still able to tweak a few things for the finishing touches, but I could tell there wasn't much more I could do to change it anymore at this point. Luckily it turned out better than I expected it would, and I was happy with it. I'm actually really proud of how this turned out, and I'm excited to see how it will look when it's painted. 
Before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people like us. On topics including illustration, design, photography, fine art, freelancing and entrepreneurship, and so much more. Skillshare classes are for beginners, pros, dabblers, masters, and include a combination of video lessons and a class project, along with feedback from a community of millions. Skillshare has classes to fit your schedule and your skill level, with most classes about 60 minutes and with short lessons to fit any schedule. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, so you can stay focused and go wherever your creativity leads you. I enjoy exploring lots of different Skillshare classes on topics I've never had the chance to study before, like graphic design. Demystifying Graphic Design, How Posters Work is a class taught by Ellen Lupton, a curator at the Smithsonian Design Museum. This class taught me about the art and strategy of poster design through the six moves that make modern graphic design so compelling. And I even got to take a virtual tour of the poster collection from the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. Ellen is so knowledgeable about the topic and her enthusiasm is contagious. I am being 100% genuine when I tell you that I am so happy to work with Skillshare as a sponsor because I truly believe that Using the internet to connect people across the globe, to share what they know, to teach and to learn creative skills, I think that's the best thing to come out of this age of global technology, if you ask me. Right now, Skillshare is offering a special promotion. So the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So you can start exploring your creativity today. I highly encourage you to click on the link and try out Skillshare today and enjoy that feeling of infinite possibility that you get when you browse through their thousands of inspiring classes and realize that there is literally so much to learn and it's all at your fingertips. I love it. <laughs> Now that I got the most intimidating parts of this project out of the way first, I can get to what I like doing the most, and that is sewing some really fancy clothing with lace and ruffles. Looking at the Phantom's Mask of the Red Death outfit that is my main inspiration, I at first thought I should create a dress with those huge puff sleeves that are a part of this costume. But I got confused because I wanted my Phantom to have a dress with a similar style and silhouette to those that Christine wears in the play, which was, I assume, the fashion in 1880s France where the story is set. This costume, however, is clearly supposed to be hearkening back to a much older time period, like maybe the Renaissance era. It kind of reminds me of Henry VIII, so I'm, I'm not sure, mid 1500s, 1600s? I thought I'd combine the puff sleeve look with the skirt shape that Christine wears in many scenes. I developed a pattern by modifying different pattern pieces from Requiem Arts, Victorian Steampunk, and Rococo patterns, and I even made a mock-up to see if I liked it. But it just reminded me of the Swan Princess, and it didn't have the right vibe for this doll. So I decided instead to use the Rococo patterns for the bodice, the variation with the insert in the bodice center specifically. I really wanted to use this gorgeous brocade fabric for this project, but I only had this small piece of it, so I'd have to make it work somehow. I used it just for the outer skirt, the bodice sides, and the sleeves, and it was just enough. The underskirt and bodice insert I cut out of some textured satin that actually matches perfectly. Don't forget the fray block. It is so important for these types of fabrics. The original costume has these V-shaped stripes as a motif throughout the outfit, so I knew I wanted to include it somewhere in my dress. I used scraps of gold and black ribbon to create alternating stripes along the bodice insert by stitching the ribbons into a V-shape in the middle and then sewing and gluing them to the bodice. The underskirt will have an alternating black and gold pattern too, but this time in the form of lace and ruffles.
I made the gold ruffles from this gold organza, which my friend Art Weasel Customs sent to me a while back. This gorgeous gold lace might look a little bit familiar because I've used it in black on a bunch of my favorite customs, starting with Chandelure, my first Halloween doll in 2017. I hand stitched all of the lace and the ruffles onto the skirt in layers. If you've watched my videos for a while, you probably know that hand stitching lace details onto doll clothes is one of my most favorite things. After adding the waistband and stitching up the underskirt, it looks really nice and voluminous with these ruffles, and the colors evoke that Halloween feeling for me. I carefully stitch the bodice insert to the side pieces and add a bit of lace to the neckline as well. These sleeves have some puff at the shoulder, so they get a gathering stitch along the top before being sewn into the sleeve holes. And look at this dainty bodice! Thanks to a copious amount of fray block, tacky glue, and a lot of patient stitching, I think it looks really neat. Like, neat as in not messy. <laughs> For the overskirt, I've already treated the edges with fray block as well. So instead of hemming or creating a separate lining to finish the edges, I'm gluing on this gold braid trim. Next, I sew a gathering stitch along the top edge, which is much wider than it needs to be because I want to have a lot of extra fabric in the back to create a bustle-like shape on the back side of the dress. Then I pin and stitch it to the underskirt's waistband. This might have been a bit neater if I had sewn the skirts together before attaching the waistband, but I was figuring it out as I went along. I also added a couple of stitches just to tack the overskirt to the underskirt so that it would fall exactly the way I wanted it to. Now that the main dress is finished, there are still some important accessories to make. One major piece will be her hat. It's a very large and imposing hat, so I kind of eyeball it to create a pattern for the wide brim of the hat. When I'm happy with the shape and size, I cut the shape out of some red craft foam. I create a smaller circle that will be the part that actually sits on the top of her head. And I also cut out a thin strip of the foam for the part that gives it its height. I'm using this sumptuous dark red stretch velvet for the hat, as well as for a cape. This velvet was used on my Eveltal doll way back. I glue the velvet onto the foam base pieces. I need both sides of the hat brim to look nice and polished, so I cover the other side as well, and I carefully trim around the edges. I definitely want to use more of this awesome gold lace along the brim of the hat, but it's so large that I'm gonna need to trim it down to make it work. I also added the top part of the remaining lace to the upper part of the hat. Then I glued the whole thing together and used rubber band to shape the hat a bit while it was drying. I also want to make her a velvet cape that drapes really nicely over her left arm. Here I'm trying to figure out how to create the dramatic drape that I want and still make it look cape shaped. <laughs> I 
I pinned the fabric into place the way that I wanted it, and I added some stitches to hold it in that position. Then I glued on more of the gold braid trim to really emphasize the drama of the drape and make the cape look much more regal and lavish. This was a little tricky to achieve because the trim is quite stiff, but I used fast grab tacky glue and a ton of mini clothespins to hold it in place until it dried in just the way that I wanted it to. To finish the cape, I stitched on a working closure by using a jewelry clasp and some gold chain. I also finally added some extra thin Velcro, my new favorite thing, to the bodice back and trimmed the bottom edge with more of the gold braid. I also used it along the edge of the hat, but apparently did so out of frame, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Now, I've been dreading this part, but I do need to style her hair. I just want it to have some curl to it, so I'm going to wash and condition it in some hot water, comb it out nicely, and then put it in curlers to dry. The curlers I'm using are pieces of straws. You wrap a piece of the hair around the straw and then wrap a cut open piece of straw over it to hold it together. You can also use bobby pins to secure them, but I was too lazy to look for my bobby pins. In order to attempt to set the curls with heat, I put the doll inside a cardboard box and then used a blow dryer to blow hot air into the box without directly blowing the air onto the doll. This dried the damp hair fairly quickly and heated up the doll without causing frizz or drying out or burning strands of the hair. I don't think I used enough heat though because the curls definitely fell out into waves after a short time. But even so, I was able to style it in a way that was similar to what I had envisioned and I still think it looks really nice. Now we just have a few details left. Her shoes won't show very much, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. I'm going to take these Blondie Locks shoes, trim off the molded on fur, and smooth out the edges with my X-Acto knife. I'm going to give her black gloved hands and little molded ruffles that came from another doll. I'm just trimming off the cuff so that I get just the ruffle shape. So when the Phantom wears this outfit when he crashes the masquerade party, he presents an original opera that he has written, and he demands it to be staged for him with Christine in the leading role. So I'm going to make my Phantom doll a little book bound in faux leather to carry around. I really love this patterned vinyl that I found. I cut a small piece and I cut up and fold some bits of scrap paper to make the pages. I'm going to use a bit of matching gold lace to make a decorative clasp on the book. I simply sew through the paper and the vinyl with needle and thread to stitch the pages to the cover. I have a particular love of miniature books and making this brought me so much joy. I need to find more excuses to make excessively fancy miniature books like this. I also stitched on a snap button to hold the book closed, but also give it the ability to be easily opened again. Although the opera written by the Phantom is actually entitled Don Juan Triumphant, I decided to write the Phantom of the Opera inside the cover instead. I also quickly drew some absolutely incorrect sheet music on the middle pages, along with some of the words from the song Masquerade. And now back to potentially the most important element of this doll, the mask. I'm painting it with an off-white, almost tan color to start because I want the skull to look old. Then I start painting on some shading with slightly darker tan tones 
and then I dry brush brown on certain areas of the skull. This really brings it to life, so to speak, and it makes it look really cool. I'm getting so excited to see what the complete doll will look like with all of the details together. Don't forget to seal the paint job with some diluted Liquitex matte varnish. I cut out a pretty piece of the lace to use as a decoration for her hair, and I'm adding blood red rhinestones onto the accessories for some extra detail. The huge hat needs to have some huge feathers sprouting from it, so I pick out some in red and black and I glue them on. I add some rhinestones to the dress as well. And for the last finishing touch, Use some sticky tack to keep the mask on the doll while also allowing it to be easily removed. And now everything is ready for our phantom doll to be completed. And now, dear audience, the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's take a look at the finished work of art. Uh-oh. What was that? Oh no, not the chandelier. I, I mean, chandelier. No. <laughs> Oof. Oh. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> There's nothing to fear, my friends. It's just a momentary hiccup. You and I need to have a talk about how my theater is to be run. <laughs> Your theater? Okay, okay, fine. We'll talk. Um, thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. We'll continue momentarily. Um, for now, please enjoy the ballet from Act 3, Maestro, the ballet. Now! This phantom's eerie elegance is exactly my style. 
I loved that I got to use fancy fabrics and lace and make a beautiful dress and detailed face up, but that she still looks a little bit bone chilling when she's wearing the terrifying mask that hides her from the world. I love her color scheme, the rich fabrics in her dress, all the textures and details, and the fact that she represents my love for a musical that I appreciate deeply due to a mixture of nostalgia and my love of drama and spectacle. The Phantom is my fifth Halloween doll that I've made on this channel, and my fourth Halloween collaborating with some really awesome doll friends, which makes me feel happy and proud to be a part of this wonderful community on YouTube. If you're new to my channel, I hope you'll subscribe if you like my content. Make sure you check out my past Halloween dolls, and I have a ton of other doll customizing videos on my channel for you to enjoy. Thank you to my fellow artists for collaborating with me to create another amazing lineup of Halloween-inspired doll creations. If you haven't yet, make sure you check out their videos by going to their channels, all listed in the description below. Thank you also to my patrons, whose generous support makes all of this doll magic possible. For early access to videos, behind-the-scenes previews, and bonus content like a full-length uncut video of this doll's face-up in detail, Check out patreon.com slash the doll fairy to see if you'd like to join in. I'd also like to remind you that the doll fairy now has an official shop with apparel, accessories, charms, stickers, and lots of cool stuff for sale. I designed all of the merch on the dollfairy.com, so head over to check it out and sign up for the email list to find out the inside scoop about upcoming sales and events. Thank you so much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed tonight's performance, and we hope to see you again soon for more doll magic here on the Doll Fairy Channel. Goodbye!